Welcome to Behind the Tools. Here's Tradeify CEO and your host, Michael Steckler. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Tools. Um, great guest this week, Alex Ingsley from Unilight, uh, also forward slash trade legends, which many of you may well have listened to, uh, which is a podcast which we'll get on to. But uh, Alex, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Thank, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, appreciate you spending the time. Do you maybe want to start with uh, explaining for those that aren't familiar with Unilight what the, the business is and how you started? Uh, so, yeah, Uni- Unilight. Uh, mother and father started the business 1981. And it was sort of like what we do now is completely different to sort of what we did back then. And we sort of, we mainly targeted sort of leisure market. We did like halogen lamps, loads of sort of tungsten bulb sort of type products. Um, and over the years, we've sort of progressed into obviously where we are now, 41 years later. And we are primarily portable lighting now for the industry professional. So any types of trades, you know, whether you're a network rail engineer or uh, an electrician, plumber, builder, you know, we we basically are putting lights or now I should say tools into people's hands that, you know, any anybody trade related. So we've completely changed where the business right. focus is. And when what what prompted that? Was there a, what was the moment in time when you decided as a company, hey, we should we should move away from you know residential to you know, trades? Uh, well, I, I probably joined the, the business 12 years ago, and it was probably within about two years of being with the company. And I, I sort of realized that, you know, the, the way that, that we were headed, it was sort of, we didn't really have a brand, we didn't really have a message. And I kept on seeing, this is how sad it was, was I kept seeing Hive is best on the back of parcel shelves in, in people's cars while I was driving along. And I thought to myself, I thought, I, I keep seeing that color. And originally when, so Hive's work work came out. Nobody wanted to wear it because I felt a bit of an idiot walking around in these yeah. these vests. You know, it was a bit like, oh, hello, look at me, you know. Um, but I just kept seeing that colour everywhere. And I thought, hold on a minute. Nobody's nobody's doing anything like this with the, the Hive's yellow. Why don't we change the brand to incorporate that? And weirdly, we sort of stumbled across something where people were like, well, actually, I could see the product um it's easier to sort of find in amongst all the other tools because right. most most people make stuff and it's black or it's green or it's red you know and they they found that they just gravitated towards the colors and the brand and it gave us our own identity we were doing different products in different colors and you know we weren't really targeting one specific market but just by changing that one step the color we almost we didn't pigeonhole ourselves, but we sort of just fell into the industrial market, and that's how that was sort of born. Just was that, tough, was that a t- tough sell to the to, to your parents when you decided that you should move in that direction, or did did everyone sort of get on board easily? Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like my my parents got divorced when I was I was probably eight years old. So my mum left the business when round about when I was eight, and my father actually moved to Australia when I was sixteen. Um, so it was my sister that was primarily running the business at the time. My father still had a hand yeah. in the business. Yeah. Um, but my sister uh, and my father were both sort of like, why don't we make the products black with little bits of yellow on the on the product? And I was sort of yeah. like, well, you can't you can't just dip your toe half in. And we actually took the products as a tester to an exhibition down the road in Coventry. And we, we were trying to get feedback on stuff. And the yellow one just picked it. So in the end, it was decided that we go with yellow with bits of black. And actually, it's the best thing that we've ever done because, you know, people watch a TV program and I get messages on social saying, oh, I've seen your head torch on this rail program or I've seen your head torch on a oh, wow, London, yeah. London sewage program and stuff like that. And it's easily identifiable that that product is us. So, you know, it wasn't it wasn't intentional that that would become synonymous with the brand. Yeah. But now it's sort of, you know, the more yellow we can put on a product, the more it seems to, you know, work for us in a, in a weird and way. It, yeah, it's really cool. And then the business really took off even more so from there, from that moment when you started yeah. to sort of get yeah. galvanized but around trades. We, we just didn't have an identity, but that color obviously is synonymous with, you know, working people, with construction. Yeah. Obviously, it, it varies different countries. I think in Australia, for example, it's orange with bits of yellow, but they're, you know, most people can identify that that is a construction type color. You know, if you were to ask anybody in the street, oh, they'd say, oh, it's a Hive's vest color. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And weirdly, that sort of gave us that connection to industry, to trades, and it became sort of that colours. You know, it's it, it's uh, familiar to everybody. Yeah. And that's yeah. it gave it us that familiarisation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you think that drove what, what else drove the success once you once you sort of moved in that direction? Was there anything you did, especially to build that reputation amongst trades? Uh, social media. Yeah, I'll be I'll be perfectly honest with you. Like, if anybody actually said to me, "What is the one specific thing that you can pinpoint where you you really sort of turn the the corner with the business?" and that was social media. Like, we're very lucky here. We had a a company just down round the round the corner from us called Gymshark. Oh, I was about um, to say. I was just about to say. You, you remind me a lot of Gymshark, but you've yeah. uh, for good reason. Yeah, I thought they might be close to you. Yeah, yeah. So he he, he was literally just down the down the road, Ben. Um, and a lot of people, when they say, oh, who inspires you or whatever, you know, it's normally Richard Branson or Alan Sugar, you know, older people. But this guy was 19, started yeah. something from his bedroom, had a little sewing machine. And I just sort of looked at what he'd done by sending products to people whose accounts he just, he just liked their account. And weirdly, he stumbled across that sort of influencer model. Um and I, I never had it in my head that, like, you know, I was going to use influencers or um, try and right. promote product that way. But these people, and some people only had, like, 5,000 followers. I just love their their content. And weirdly, some of these people that have had 5,000 followers now have 150,000 followers. Right. But we've been yeah. with them across that whole journey and supported those those people. And weirdly, people are like, why haven't I ever seen these products? And it just sort of, it took us to a much wider audience. We went from having uh, distributors in probably six or seven countries to around about 50 countries now. Oh, wow. Yeah, so quite, that's huge. And if I can pinpoint, obviously, that growth, we were picking up, especially in the uh, automotive sort of car detailing marketplace, we were picking up distributors from countries like Latvia, Estonia, uh, Hungary, uh, Serbia, you know, like Malta, countries where normally we'd never really get a foothold in because some of them aren't highly industrial places. Yeah. You know, there isn't yeah. much industry there. Um, but we were we were finding that social media just, it just kept coming for us. And was that people that were, when you were sort of finding those influencers, were they all, all UK based or were you just going by sort of volume and the type of work uh, they did? No, I, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, you obviously just look at the amount of followers that somebody's got. And it, it, it genuinely, when I started sending products to people, it was it was just accounts of people whose content I liked. People that I actually found interesting. Like it didn't, you know, some people have like a thousand followers, but I just love their, their accounts. And weirdly, I don't know whether I've, you know, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but I must have been a good judge because some of these accounts just went like that. But I just found I could watch these people and, and found them yeah. interesting. And then as they grew, you know, it, it sort of it didn't just happen overnight. We we grew as well because people yeah. were seeing yeah. our products being used by these people. And I sort of I didn't put the connection together initially. And then as it sort of went like that, I sort of soon realised actually I've stumbled across something here which I didn't really intend to. A bit like the the high vis colour. You know, a lot yeah. of this is people yeah. go, oh, it's it's strategically planned. This is what I wanted to do and I executed perfectly. You know, I'll be perfectly honest with you. It just, it just sort of happened by accident, probably. Well, I think you've probably identified a, a thing that's missing or is obviously aligned to a certain industry. But there, yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. there's an element of time, timing with these things. And I think the social media thing is interesting because you've you have a very i mean I, I sort of looked at it and i think the way you've approached we'll, we'll get onto trade legends but even with unilite you do you have a full-time team doing that stuff i mean some of the content you produce is really cool i was looking at you had the dual lipper song with someone wiping a wiping a light um caught my attention there's a few things like that how much time is that is that a team now doing that how did you approach that initially uh well the, the first sort of thing that happened with us was uh about two years ago i decided that we do a bit of a direct to consumer type thing um, looking at brands like Nike, Dyson, uh, Adidas, you know, especially with Yeezy, with uh, the shoes and stuff like that. Yeah. And a lot of these companies were doing direct to consumer. Now, primarily our business is, is B2B, 
So it's through distribution. But we were finding that there's still some people in certain countries that couldn't order product from us because we didn't have a distributor. So we started with the the direct to consumer type stuff, and just sort of we sort of grew grew from there. And we were just uh, you know trying to push push people through on 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 direct to consumer, and then that blew up, and social media combined with that. So everything just everything came together at at one specific point. So uh, yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, no. So it's it's really it's really it's really cool that happened. And did you just did you know about that stuff? Did you just set up a Shopify account or something? And how did you approach that? Uh, we 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 hired a, an outside agency, and right. what ended okay. up and what? But they, yeah. I'll be honest with you, they didn't tell me any of this. I just sort of I was picking stuff up from listening to Ben Francis and his YouTube videos. But the marketing agency, ironically, I soon found that they didn't quite grasp the brand. When you outsource that type of stuff, these companies, yeah, the they, they don't understand what you're trying to achieve or who you're trying to target because I'll be perfectly honest with you, none of them are tradespeople. No, so, what, no. so, what en- so what ended up happening was over time, I started pulling back from there and I, I soon realized again because I watched Ben Francis's videos and he said, we ended up setting a team up within the business. So I looked at a few of the people that work for the agency and Nathan, who's our head of digital, used to work for them. Right. And he he decided at one point, he was like, look, I'm going. I've had enough of the agency. I'm leaving. I had a conversation with him and said, which bits of our work do you do? And he probably did 90% of the stuff for us. Right. Yeah. So I sort of I, I kept on saying to him, don't go freelance, don't go free. He went freelance for about four months. He was living up in Leeds and then convinced him to come down. Um, but the other guys in the team, Jack, I picked him up because I thought, well, we need a videographer. You know, we're primarily, we've got a great photographer called Chris who takes some real high-end shots for us. Like he, he does some like, you know, I look at his work, it's unbelievable. But I wanted to bring people in-house and the videographer Jack turned up and, you know, we started putting more content out and shorter Instagram videos. That sort of worked really well. So I brought another guy in called Gonzalo and then eventually social media got that big because it was me running the platforms. Yeah. That I've had to I've had to bring Charlotte in now to help us, and she's the one who's doing those sort of TikTok star videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've seen. Yeah. Um, so she's younger than me, so she gets TikTok. Obviously, I'm you know I'm almost forty now, so I look at TikTok and I'm just like, oh, it's terrible. But she's she's much <laughs> that's, better. That's, so that's when you that's when you know you've gone past the, the trend, Mr. Trend. Yeah, 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 yeah. But she, yeah. To, to be to be fair to all of those those guys, they're all younger than me. And I yeah. think that's, you know, social media, it changes so quick. It is a younger, like, a you know, not being ageist here, but it is a younger person's game. And I did I did well at the time with what I did. But obviously, it's time to pass the baton over to somebody else and and, and leave them to it. But I'd always advise if any, yeah. any, co- any companies are listening to bring stuff in-house. There's so, so many large companies that still have marketing agencies that are t- still telling them to, do adverts on TV or put stuff into a newspaper or print media and all that stuff is dead. It's just social media and that is it. I can't stress that to people enough. Yeah, it's really interesting as well that you've taken that approach of, uh, I, I don't know if it's about age, but it's about people that are native on those tools, right? They, they live and breathe them. I think whenever I've looked for social media people, the first thing I've done is looked at their profile, right? And to yeah. see like, do they post a lot? Are they active? Are they using TikTok? Do they do this stuff? Do they get it? Um, and I agree the problem with outsourcing, it can be useful. I think at a moment in a company's gestation when you can't afford maybe to have people in house, but you're right. They miss that. What's the company really about? What's the tone of voice? Mm-hmm. What's the end customer really understanding the end customer is really, yeah. really key. Um, I mean, so, yeah, if, that's, uh, it's really, cool I, that you've done that. yeah. I mean, if I, if I look at it, obviously when I went through with the agency, cause a lot of people say to me, how much do you pay for your website? It's 50,000 pounds for my website. And that's like, you know, if I was to say that to some people and they're paying £20,000 for their website, they're like, Bruh. and that's why I said to myself, hold on a minute, if I can have somebody in-house that's doing that over two, three years, I could just keep changing my website as much as I want. Yeah, you do what you like with it, yeah. And it's, and it's not going to... It's out of date, yeah, yeah. yeah. And who wants to pay £50,000 every few years to, to change stuff because technology is moving? It's the same with a yep. videographer. If you hire a videographer and the cameras and the equipment for the day, it could end up costing you between three to five thousand pounds each time. So if you do that four or five times a year, 
you might as well just bring somebody in house. Buy all the buy all the equipment and get somebody to use it. You know what they're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah so. completely. Yeah, and then when you think about you know that was sort of building the brand, and the reputation, and growing the business. How did you think yeah. about product innovation? What where did you get your cues for what products to build and how to approach that? In social media, I, I, I you know, if you speak to somebody like PB, uh, he'll tell you I'm sort of like the the Jose Mourinho of of sort of social media. I've got stats on people. I've got like you know a whole database yeah. on on stuff that people have done or their work or the things that they promote. And I'm permanently watching videos of them working and looking and thinking, hold on a minute. I've seen 20 people do that same job. They're all using a light like this, but they're struggling to to do that. Or I can see that they're removing a boiler casing and doing this. And then, you know, the light couldn't stay there. So I need to find, I need to put a hook so it can hang somewhere. Um, I'm obsessive with stuff like that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. it's that those types of things that like you know a little tiny detail that i could change that's made a product 50 times more popular I, I bring stuff out sometimes and it doesn't quite work and then i watch again and i go ah that's what i should have done and then on version two we change something and all of a sudden it's it catch, yeah catches yeah yeah. yeah. so but i wouldn't have been able to do any of that sort of side of things or have more time to do that if I hadn't have brought these other people in to help me with the digital side of the business because that takes up like people see a 10 second TikTok and they don't realize sometimes that that 10 second TikTok can take two days to plan. Well, that's why I asked the question about you know people in house because I looked at you, yeah. you know, I look at your feed and I think, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in here. You're pretty A, you're active, B, there's a lot of content. It's regularly updated, and that that does take time. I think people underestimate it's not just taking a video yourself and sticking it up yeah. there. I mean, that's part of it, but there's there's a lot more to it. Um, yeah. And it's also it's good advice to trades companies in general, right? Which is you start off small, you know, as you start to scale, you can see the growth opportunity. That's when you yeah. invest in people that can do the bits that you either don't have time to do or aren't very good at. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's good it's good advice for anyone. And then you met, you know, PB Plumber was he one of the people that you sort of engaged with early on? He was the first, he was probably the first person that I sent products to, Pete. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Um, he, he, was, he was either the first one or one of the, the first three that I sent products to. He just said, he just said to me, he said, he said, I'm not a fan of like stuff that's heavily plastic, which right. obviously to, to produce a product, it's, it's cheaper to produce them if they're plastic. Obviously, you know, yeah. they've still got to withstand stuff, but they're cheaper to produce. And at the time it was sort of, I was very much of the mindset of I didn't want to be the most expensive, but I didn't want to be the cheapest. So I was trying to get that medium with materials because, right. you know, we brought that light out of the, spe- the specific work light that we still sell actually. Um, and at the time it was expensive for what it was. It wasn't the most expensive, but it was expensive. And I still remember people going, oh, I'm not going to pay that. I'm not going to pay that. And, you know, four or five years later, it's one of our best selling items now. Yeah, and pe- people don't really look at the price because others have started doing similar stuff. Uh, but Pete was just like, I'm "Sorry, Al," he says, "I've got to be honest with you, it's just not my thing." And then I sent him. I thought, right, okay, I'm I'm not going to take that from you. And I designed some new hexagonal sort of uh, work lights that were aluminium diecast aluminium. Right. I sent sent those to him, and he went, and he ended up just all the other products that he was using. He just he just said, "I, I, I don't use any of them anymore." And that's how that relationship sort of built. But Pete was, I probably appreciated Pete's feedback because actually he encouraged me to think, well, it's not always about trying to find that happy medium for the customer. Right. And and after that point, I was just like, even if it costs more, I'm going to do it. Whereas before I used to think like, oh, I've got to pay for an extra mold to put a logo on a switch or I've got to do this or to put a little logo on a headband clip. And then all of a sudden I thought, the same thing with packaging we changed all the packaging so the packaging now is like an iphone box yeah because i wanted yeah. somebody when they when they get the product to look at the box and think okay how the box is even feels expensive then they open the box and it looks expensive inside yeah. you know they take the product out it feels expensive and then when they're using it they're they're like wow look at this what have i been doing yeah yeah, so, yeah, that's it's, it's an important point. Um, so you, you sort of took his feedback, and then you know you built the team out from that. You've grown the team a lot, I, I presume, in the last few years. How did yeah. you approach hiring? A lot of trade companies struggle to hire. How did you? How did you approach that? 
Uh, we, we've got a mantra in here, which sounds it sounds pretty harsh when you say it out loud because I was thinking about that earlier. But it's uh, hire slow and fire fast, and that's sort yeah. of in in here. We you know people talk about culture, and I used to hate that word because it's so like it's such business speak on LinkedIn. Like, oh yeah, we've got an amazing culture. It's all about the culture in here. But we just we find normal people. It's not always to me about your CV, where you've worked, like how much experience you've got. Are you going to fit within our business? And I'll be perfectly honest with you, 95% of the people that come through that door are never going to fit within our company. And it's basically because it's a bit like an Elon Musk Twitter. Is there's freedom to sort of say and do whatever you want as obviously as long as you're not sort of racist misogynistic or like homophobic right. or anything like that you everybody here has the same voice and there's not many people there's some people that like to shout louder than others and when they come in you have to weed those people out because they can just right. drown out they can drown out other people that potentially yeah. have really good qualities i'm quite extrovert but actually you put me on a ca- on a camera sometimes i go quite introvert and the yeah. same with some of the people out there they're very introvert and it's trying to extract that from them and you know you just you just sit there in in interviews and you think and you're going to get eaten alive in there or you're not you know you're not the right fit and everybody says oh do you even read cvs and i just i literally go no done like i, I can yeah. i can analyze a cv within about 30 seconds of whether that person's going to fit it doesn't work all the time no, but we've got no, we've got it to a point now where I'd say ninety percent of the time when we're hiring people, especially the last few years, it's taken a long time to get to that that point. But a lot of the time as well now, I don't just do the interview, and we'll take other people from the team in to get their thoughts on it. Yeah. Which before, yeah, as a, yeah. as, a, as a manager, you know, and I'm sort of trying to learn my role here, I never used to think, well, maybe I should take other people in from the team that's actually going to be working with them. So even something as, you know. It's so how do I how do I describe that? Glaring is taking somebody in from your team to actually interview somebody out. You know, I never thought of that. And that's been the last yeah. three to three to four years actually thinking, well, hold on a minute, they're going to be working with them all the time. Let's take them in. So yeah. Cool. Great. And then sort of moving away from Unilite for a sec, trade legends. how did that how did that come about? So um I'm sure many people listen to this probably listen to it um i think more people probably listen to trade legends than, than this at the moment um, <laughs> how do you uh, what made you what made you do that what was the idea behind that uh again uh i, I listened to there's a guy called steve bartlett that there's a, yeah. uh, a podcast called diary of a ceo um and again he had ben francis on that's how i found his podcast yeah. but i just probably about four years ago i got when we have a, there's a guy who comes in here called uh, Townsend Interiors and he's a carpenter. He does all like the cabinets and everything in here. And I don't know why. I just said to him, I was like, I, don't, I wouldn't mind doing a podcast. I said, would you be able to do- design something? He said, yeah, I'll design it for you. And he did some drawings and that sort of sat in my phone for probably three years. And then COVID hit and I was in my back garden. Obviously, nobody was able to go anywhere. And I had yeah. these b- beers from a beer company. And they're based just in in Warwickshire. And I'm drinking these beers. I said, oh, I really like these beers. And I looked at the label. I thought, hold on a minute. The guy who did my wedding suit, he gave me a number to produce beers because I said I wouldn't mind getting some done for Unilite. Um, and it was the same company. So I ended up ringing, right. this, co- ringing this company. You, this is going to sound really weird. Ended up ringing this company. I went and made some beers. And I thought, now's the time to start the podcast because I can have people on and we can drink our own beers on the podcast and just sit down and have a chat. So we started making these beers and then, you know, we were running out of space in here because we were hiring loads of people through the pandemic because we were growing so fast. And we just decided, well, we're going to expand the office. And the sis was going, well, if we expand the office, you know, what do you want to put in this room here? Do you want it as a media room? I said, I want to put podcasts in there. Obviously, she said to me, what, what you're talking about? Um, ended up spending twenty thousand pounds on a podcast set. Uh, thinking, am I doing the right thing here? But we'd produced these beers as well, and I was thinking, well, hold on a minute, I've produced these beers now. I need to, I need to drink them, and I'm not going to be able to drink them by myself. <laughs> so you um, the podcast to drink the beers that you'd ordered. Okay, yeah, I get it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we- weirdly, and then 
we built we built the set and it was just I, I said to Peter, I said, look, if I talk to people from trades, I don't really know the ins and outs of being a tradesperson. It's not what I do. I supply you guys. But from a business perspective, I get it. So yeah. I just said to him, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to need somebody to to co-host it with. And he was a bit like, mm, not too sure. Podcast. Mm. And I told him the name as well. And he said, why have you called it Trade Legends? He was really angry. He was like, I don't want people thinking they're legends. You know, nobody's really a legend. We're all the same. He said, why couldn't you have called I can't remember the name he came up with, but it, the name he came up with was terrible. And I just said to him, I said, people that come on, they are legends in their own right. I said, like, they, they go to work, they work hard. You know, people follow them on social. Why not call it that? And it was sort of born out of out of. Well, you're, you're probably more likely to listen to a podcast that's trade legends versus, uh, you know, average yeah. trades or or something like that. Yeah. I just, uh, just, I wanted a name that pe- it was easy to remember and that yeah. people, people would see the logo and recognize the logo and they'd be like all oh, trade legends. Or oh, if you watch that trade legends podcast, it was just easy to, to remember. It's two words. You know, if you can't yeah. remember that, then, you know, like diary of a CEO is, it's quite long-winded. Yes. It's trade yeah. legends. Just always try and keep yeah. stuff short. Yeah, yeah. And have you? Has that has that helped your business? Do you think in terms of um, recognition, but also stuff? Have you do you learn stuff when you talk to the talk to tradespeople that you you have on? I get to understand the things that that worry them, or the things that they they need, or you know, like, all of them always tell me there's not enough time. So when I'm making yeah. a product, it, in my head, I'm sitting there thinking, am I solving something where they think, God, using that product has made my job 2% easier? Because that 2% of them is money or extra time to do extra work. So little things yeah. like that and you know, them talking about the price of materials and you get to understand from their perspective. You know, When you're a manufacturer, you're sort of making something, you're like, just buy it, just buy it. But actually it's given me a bit more sort of, insight compassion or understanding of how it is from the other side yeah yeah which is which is vitally important because if you as a manufacturer take the time to understand your customer you will always make better products and better decisions for them yeah so, I, well, I think we have a similar approach. i mean it's partly why i do this you know my background wasn't in the trades and so mm-hmm. i think I, I have the same perspective which is it reaffirms some things I, I i sort of have a suspicion about or think that we should think about but also it, it often brings up things we haven't thought about and you know we put that into our product roadmap and think about things yeah. differently so it's, yeah it's really valuable and your audience presumably is, is it pretty global uh it's it's going more global now um obviously we're doing more sort of overseas uh yeah. interviews we've had uh matt addicted to tools we've had tammy uh tammy voss um and then we've had uh mechanical hub from the us we've actually got yeah. one on friday which is uh damani from diamondback tool belt um so we're trying to encompass everybody because actually you know the trade community in the uk is is pretty tight most people know everybody and yeah. most people realistically know maybe I don't know, 30% of their audience is actually abroad as well. So I'm trying to make it where I shrink that trade community. Um, and hopefully, you know, people from the US will tune in because they'll think, actually, I quite, I'd quite like to hear yeah. about that person or somebody from Australia would be like, well, actually, I'm, I'm really interested in that person as well. And then vice versa, people from the UK think, oh, I've never, I've never seen so much about that person. So it's trying to sort of, you know, open people up to... right. Right to other experiences or other uh, areas and the challenges they face and stuff like that. Did you have an ambition for it? Did you have an ambition to either sell more products or was there a what was, no. it, was it a, I, apart I, from the beer? Was it apart from having to shift all the beer? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was. It was primarily for me. It was more of a hobby. I'm just interested right. in in people. I'm interested in people and listening to their stories like that. The thing is, again, with manufacturers, a lot of them, when they get bigger, they lose sight of, you know, that, that customer, their, their world is that little self-employed right. business that they've got. Yeah. You know, some people have very big businesses like Charlie Mullins, the Pimlico Plumbers guy we had on, but some, most people, they've got five or six people working for them. And that's, 
that's their world but these big manufacturers forget about that and for me i i didn't want to ever lose sight of that we've we've grown massively but I just felt as well obviously doing the podcast it's more of a hobby i get to listen to people yeah. but actually i didn't want to lose sight of what we were as a business so just just fancy giving it a go yeah Don't know is it, and is it do you have do you have help on that in terms of the team is that distracting is it a lot of work getting guests and all that stuff I'll, I'll be honest with you i created sort of about another 30 percent worth of work for myself and yeah. and primarily jack who was the videographer he was doing most bits for unilight he's pretty much full-time on trade legend with stuff at the moment um we're just trying to find the easiest way to work with stuff because we're still trying stuff which are still trying to yeah. find what works for us to help grow the the channel obviously once we get the the final recipe but the first year i said to these guys i said look don't always think about the numbers you've just got to find what works but obviously to do that it takes a lot of time and resources um, but i'm in the position where obviously because i i own another business it doesn't really matter so much there's not you know that pressure thinking yes, well actually pressure. we need we need to get the numbers straight away and this has to be x number of yeah 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 yeah, yeah. But I, I always judge everything by the engagement and the engagement and stuff is is fantastic for us at the moment. So I just, uh, I say to these, I say sometimes you have to take a step back and think, well, you know, the follow-up counts steady, but it's the engagement that we get from people. Yeah, and you've done a few things much like you have with Unilite, right, to get that engagement, I presume, with things like the Keep Me Up, Keep You Up Challenge and, you know, yeah, things yeah. like that within there, which I, think, I presume drives quite a lot of engagement and interest around it. What's yeah. the what's the record at the moment on that? Just have interest? I think it's about 50 something, which was a guy from oh. Jackhammer. Yeah, I think it was about 50. Something oh, like that. Beatable. Yeah, yeah. 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 You get okay. getting in training. <laughs> I did start, I will start some training. Next time I come up, I will, yeah, yeah, I will. I will have to do that. It's going to be one of those yeah. things. I presume a lot of people go in the studio there and then their nerves get them and, you know, they're usually probably pretty good. And uh, a, f- a few have. I mean, Pete's, Pete's probably the funniest. He did one on season one and he managed two on season two. And then he, uh, he tried to be moaned that he tripped over his own foot. And I was like, oh, Pete, <laughs> nobody can help you with that, mate. So, yeah, he was uh, he was pretty pathetic, Pete was, at the keepy of his. So, hopefully he gets the three on season three. Season Double. three, yeah, cool. Yeah. Great. Um, this has been fantastic. I mean, it's a really inspirational story. I think we don't often get to, we, you know, meet lots of people and social media seems to be the common thread, the people that get it. Yeah. Uh, really lean into that and, and get a lot of growth. So it's really cool you've done that. I think it's fascinating that you had Gymshark around the corner. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I did actually think um, yeah. there's a lot of similarities. So that's really interesting that you, you sort of followed that that lead, which is which is cool. Mm. We always finish on a few questions. Uh, yeah. I'm going to start with the, the the big one. You said you're not from the trades, but if you were in a trade, what would you uh, what would you pick? I would probably have to say being a contractor, and the the, the reason being is like a contractor seems to do a bit of everything i think if i was to just do one trade specifically like be an electrician or a plumber i'd probably get bored like i i like to experience different things whether that's like plastering or you know being right. do, doing plumbing stuff or i don't know even fitting windows i'd like to do a bit of everything so i yeah. think pro- probably a contractor that oversees all this type of stuff would probably be the the one that I go into, I think. Good, good fit for you. And then when yeah. you look at tall brands, I mean, you, without without saying you, you know, like obviously, if there, are there other tall brands you look at and go that you take a, a sort of influenced by or inspired by? Uh, uh, yeah, probably uh, Vera or we- Vera Tools. I don't know how you say it. The German, the German brand. Their their branding for me is is like yeah. is really good, and the and the product's good. But even the likes yeah. of uh, Nipex. We are. I like. I probably like the German stuff. If I'm honest, like hand tools. Yeah. Hand tools is more my thing. Um, yeah. But just yeah. probably them. They they really yeah. work hard on the look of the product, the packaging, the exhibition stands, like the t-shirts, the stickers that they do, and that's something that we do. So I sort of see quite a lot of similarities with us and us and them. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And then um, when you have lunch. Around there in Redditch, what's the what would be a, a, a good treat? I'm I'm a salad guy. I'm going to sound really bland and boring, but I just I, I always eat. I pretty much if if Anna my PA goes out to get me fit, I always eat the same same food pretty much every day. So just like a tuna salad or a chicken salad or something like that. I'm always just everyone's like it's the middle of winter and you're eating salad. 
So I don't, go off, is, there, is there anything if you're going to go off piece that you would uh... probably a pizza oh a pizza P- there you a, go. P- a pizza's my guilty secret you were like salads yeah. just so boring mate I need to give, give me something no else. I need something I need some material <laughs> <laughs> give me something else um, cool and then like, last question I mean you talk to a ton of people so I mean I've, I've listened to a lot of your episodes but is there anyone you think would be, make a great guest that we haven't maybe spoken to uh, there's, there's loads I mean, if, if if I had to choose somebody, the one person that I always watch on social media is Ryan Escuter. And that's basically like a lot of people, you either love him or, or you hate him. He's like Marmite, but he's just, he's quite blunt. He's a typical cockney, like, yeah, well, I'm up on the top of this building, you know, like, yeah, you know, like sort of thing. And it just find his, his content. That wasn't I a could, great accent, by the way. Yeah, no, it's terrible, wasn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm from Birmingham, so I can't do anybody else's accent. But he, well, it wasn't bad, yeah. But go on. But he, uh, yeah, he, he's content. It's just, you, it's almost like watching a TV channel. Yeah, and you and you can just sit there and you can watch his stories all day. And again, he's a contractor, so he's he's showing different bits, so every trade can sort of look at it and, and pick up tips or go, oh yeah, that's. I've never seen something done like that before. Yeah. Um, so he's, his channel is good. Ryan Davis is a electrician. Yeah. MJ Tiff, who's a plumber. And these are for different reasons. Obviously, MJ Tiff, I like his YouTube. Ryan Davis, I like his TikTok and his Instagram. Um, but probably Ryan SQ2, if I had to, you know, nail my, my money to the mask. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Great. No, good recommendation. Great. Well, I know you're a very busy man uh, running a successful podcast and a very successful business. Um, really appreciate yeah. you spending the time. Really, really interesting. I mean, congrats on the success. Look forward to seeing where it goes in the next next few years. And uh, yeah, thanks, yeah, hopefully Frank. we can catch, catch them in person soon. And look, yeah, I'll let you get back to it. But appreciate it. And everyone that's listening, hope that was, uh, I think it was a really good podcast. And if you've got any comments or reviews, as always, do let us know. Hit us up in the usual places and we will see you next time. Alex, thanks again. Yeah, thanks, mate. Yeah, appreciate it. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Behind the Tools is brought to you by Tradeify, job management software for your trade business. If you enjoyed the podcast, let us know by leaving a review and be sure to tell your mates about it. Email behindthetools at tradeifyhq.com if you or someone you know would be keen to join the show as a guest.